Hello, welcome everyone. Welcome to another video podcast on neuroanatomy. Here we will be talking about the motor areas of the cerebral cortex, including the primary motor area, the premotor area, the supplementary motor area, and we'll also be uh, talking a little bit about something which is known as the homunculus. Now, before we begin describing these areas, just uh, remember that uh, although the different areas of the cerebral cortex are functionally specialized, the precise division of the cortex into different areas of specialization sometimes oversimplifies and misleads the reader. Even the simple division of the cerebral cortex into, uh, into motor and sensory is sometimes erroneous as well, as many of the sensory areas are far more extensive than originally described. And uh, is uh, and and sensory areas are uh, mo and, and sometimes the motor responses can be el elicited even by stimulation of the sensory areas. Like if we, if we look at the, some of the cognitive neuroscience research, uh, we'll see that you know for many of the activities, the motor activities, the front end and the the back end of the brain, they're literally communicating with each other all the time. Uh, so the the different areas of the brain are really interconnected with each other. However, for the sake of simplicity, we will describe the different areas, different motor areas separately, one by one. Let's begin with the primary motor area. Well, the primary motor area resides inside the pre-central gyrus. So let's just actually start by orientating this prosection over here. So what you're looking over here is basically the lateral or the supralateral view of the cerebral cortex and you're looking at the left cerebral cortex here this is the the front end of the brain uh, so that will be our frontal lobe and we can see the cerebellum at the back this is the occipital lobe and the temporal lobe is down below over here there are one of the one of the one of the main sulcus which we can see on the supralateral surface is the central sulcus and you can see a sulcus running uh, in parallel to the central sulcus, which is the pre-central sulcus, and um, it's it's running parallel to the central sulcus, and both of these uh, are going to be uh, in jumping onto the medial side as well, which we'll, we will see in a second. In fact, if you look at the central sulcus here on the medial view, you can see that the central sulcus comes onto the medial side as well, and then it gets clasped over here by this uh, gyrus, the paracentral lobule. So the precentral gyrus, which is hosting the primary motor area, that is situated in between the central sulcus at the back and the precentral sulcus in the front. So if you if you just want to highlight the precentral uh, gyrus or the primary motor area, then it is situated right over here, the central sul between the central sulcus and between the precentral sulcus over here. This is also uh, represented by the Broadman's area number four. Right. So now, if you look over here, the precentral gyrus is extending. Uh, over the superior margin uh, and dipping down onto the medial surface and here it is actually forming part of a structure which is known as part of a gyrus which is known as the paracentral lobule the paracentral lobule is a gyrus which is clasping the central sulcus the anterior part of paracentral lobule is being formed by the precentral gyrus uh, just like we have a precentral gyrus uh, in front of the central sulcus we've got a postcentral gyrus at the back and the postcentral gyrus forms a posterior part of the paracentral lobule when it comes over to the medial side. But that's obviously not part of the uh, topic of discussion for the day. So this is our primary motor area. Now, let's elaborate a little bit upon the functioning of the primary motor area. Uh, uh, so for instance, one important thing which you have to know is that if the primary motor area is electrically uh, stimulated, then that will result in isolated movements of the opposite side of the body. Or in other words, the stimulation results in movements on the contralateral side of the body. These usually involve voluntary muscles, especially the distal muscles of the limbs. And the reason for this contralateral control of the body is that most of the neural pathways, they cross the midline to reach the opposite side at some point along their course. This crossing is called as decussation, and therefore, usually the right side of the brain controls the left, left side of our body 
while the left brain controls the right side of our body. This also means that if there is a stroke involving the right precentral gyrus, then, uh, uh, or in other words, the right primary motor area, then there will be paralysis of the voluntary muscles on the left side of the body. And here we're looking at the precentral gyrus on the left cerebral hemisphere. So if there's involvement of the uh, precentral gyrus on the left side because of the stroke of the vessel uh, or clot, because of the clot of the vessel, let's say, which is supplying this area, then that would result in the paralysis of voluntary muscles on the right side of the body. This is extremely important information to know when you examine a patient with a neurological lesion and you try to localize that lesion on the basis of history and clinical examination. Now here I would like to take this opportunity to discuss about something which is called as the homunculus. Right, so let's just jump over to this illustration over here and what we can see over here is basically a view of the supralateral uh, surfaces of the cerebral hemispheres, uh, this being the right side, this being the left side, and you can see the front end of the brain over here. Now, uh, this color-coded region basically represents the precentral gyrus, so we can see the central sulcus right behind it and precentral sulcus in front of it on the left side. Now, we've taken a coronal or a side-to-side -side section through the brain, and that section taken through the precentral gyrus has been shown over here, right? So you're looking at the medial surface of the brain over here. This is the supralateral view, and this would be the lateral sulcus. So we've got the parietal lobe at the top and temporal lobe down below. Right, now the movement areas of the body, uh, what you can see over here is that different body areas are kind of, you know, drawn in a cartoonic uh, uh, illus uh, illustration fashion on, on top of the cut section of the cerebral cortex. Uh, you can probably appreciate that the movement areas of the body are represented in a sequential but in an inverted fashion uh, on the precentral gyrus the somatotopic or organi this somatotopic organization of the body parts on the precentral gyrus is known as the motor homunculus for instance starting from below over here and passing superiorly are the structures involved in swallowing and those related to the movements of the tongue jaw lips larynx larynx eyes the next is an extensive the next area is an extensive region for movement uh, of the fingers, especially the thumb, and then the hand, wrist, and then come then comes the shoulder and the trunk. The movements of the hip and the knee are in the highest region of the precentral gyrus. The movements of the ankle, uh, the lower leg, the ankle, uh, they are all represented on the uh, on the medial surface of the cerebral hemisphere in the paracentral lobule. So basically over here. Uh, similarly, the movements of the anal and the, and the vesicle sphincters are also located on the paracentral lobule. Now, what you can probably appreciate here is that the area of the cortex which is controlling a particular movement is proportional to, to the skill involved in performing the movement. In other words, the complexity and the fineness of the movement and is unrelated to the mass of the muscle participating in, the, in, the, in that movement. So uh, you can probably see the trunk musculature and the leg musculature don't have as big uh, a representative area on the cerebral cortex as the, the fine intricate uh, 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 movements of the hands and the, and the head and neck area require. Uh, thus, the function of the, of the primary motor area is to carry out individual movements of different parts of the body. Uh, to assist in this function, it receives numerous afferent fibers from the premotor area, the sensory cortex, the thalamus, the cerebellum, and the basal ganglia, and many other structures. The primary motor cortex, the thing which is important to know over here is that the primary motor cortex is not responsible for the design of the pattern of movement. It's not responsible in the planning of movement, but it is the final station for conversion of, dis of that planned movement into execution 
Uh, so what, in other words, what I'm saying is that the premotor area, once it is done with planning of the movement, that planned movement is sent to the primary motor cortex in the precentral gyrus, and then it is just simply executed from over there through the descending pathways, such as the cortical spinal pathways and many others. Now, since we have talked a little bit about the homunculus, so how about if we actually just uh, elaborate upon this a little bit more by talking about the vasculature of the cerebral cortex through the cerebral arteries, because then uh, this would actually give you an opportunity to understand the clinical significance of knowing the homuncular uh, arrangement of the body representation on this on the on the precentral gyrus. Uh, so what you can see over here is that uh, we've got. Uh, uh, an artery over here called anterior cerebral artery and another one which is known as the middle cerebral artery. Both of these arteries are involved. They're branches of the of the internal carotid artery and they are responsible for uh, supplying the uh, cerebral cortex. Uh, and uh, there's another artery which is called the posterior cerebral artery, but we're not uh, concerned with that for now. Now, an important thing uh, to know here is that the anterior cerebral artery, so if you, if you just look over here, the anterior cerebral artery is supplying the cortical region on the medial side and perhaps a, a, a centimeter long strip of cortex on the supralateral surface. So uh, all the cortical areas uh, in the motor homunculus which are responsible for controlling the body movements of the, of the lower part of the body, such as the lower limbs, uh, would be compromised if there is, let's say, a stroke involving the anterior cerebral artery. On the contrary, the middle cerebral artery, if you look over here, it has uh, an area of vascular supply on the supralateral surface in a region where the upper limbs are being represented or the head and neck area is being represented. And uh, like uh, from a neurological localization perspective, and we, when, we, when we're taking a neurological history or we're doing a neurological exam, this important information is really critical in helping us localizing the lesion. For instance, for instance, if uh, let's say a patient uh, presents with uh, a weakness of the of the right upper limb, then uh, then that basically means that if we have to choose between these two options, that means that we, we know that the, uh, the, uh, the body is represented in a contralateral uh, fashion on the brain. So a weakness on the right side means that there is a left cerebral hemisphere which is involved. And since the weakness resides in the upper limb, then that means that uh, the uh, the m middle cerebral artery is most probably compromised. I mean, obviously, there could be other reasons for that as well, but right now we're just choosing between the ACA and the MCA. So, uh, therefore, the potential uh, answer is uh, a stroke in the uh, distribution of the middle cerebral artery on the left side. Similarly, if there is a patient, let's say, let's take another case example. So if there is a weakness, if there's a paralysis of the lower limb on the right side, then that means there is involvement this time of the anterior cerebral artery on the left side. So left MCA could be the right answer. Similarly, for the left arm weakness, a right, uh, a right MCA would be the possible answer. And uh, lastly, if let's say a patient presents with a weakness on the left side, but in the legs, then that means the right-sided artery is involved. And since the legs are involved, then most probably a right-sided ACA is involved. So this is how we actually apply this information clinically to localize the lesion. Now let's jump over to the next area, which is the next motor area, which is the pre- motor area. Let's talk about that a little bit. So I'm just, I'm just going to uh, go back to our previous illustration over here where we kind of color coded the precentral gyrus, which is the primary motor area. Now let's have a look as to where the premotor area is situated. This has been color coded in yellow over here. And the premotor area, which is the secondary motor area, is also known as the Broadman's area six. It might extend a little bit anteriorly to involve the area 8 or might actually go down a little bit to involve area 44 and 45, but mainly the Broadman's area 6 is the domain of the premotor area. 
Uh, the premotor area occupies the anterior part, as you can see over here, it, 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 it occupies the anterior part of the precentral gyrus and a little bit of the posterior parts of the superior frontal gyrus, middle frontal gyrus, and the inferior frontal gyri. Uh, it is wider superiorly, as you can see clearly over here, uh, than uh, as compared to down below, where it narrows down to be confined to the anterior part of the precentral gyrus. Electrical stimulation of the, of the premotor area produces muscular movements similar to those obtained by uh, stimulation of the primary motor area. However, stronger stimulation is necessary to produce the same degree of movements. The premotor area receives numerous inputs from the sensory cortex, the thalamus, the basal ganglia. Uh, however, the important thing to know over here is that the function of the premotor area is uh, basically the planning of the movement. Uh, it stores the programs of motor activity assembled as a result of past experience. Uh, so, motor area, the, so the premotor motor area basically programs the activity of the primary motor area. Once the planning is done in the premotor area, in conjunction with the higher order association areas, that motor program is sent to the primary motor area, and the primary motor area, uh, which is the Broadman's area number four, the, or the precentral gyrus, that just simply executes the movement. Uh, the premotor area is particularly involved in controlling the coarse postural movements uh, rather than the distal movements which are uh, particularly linked to the precentral gyrus uh, and uh, the postural movements would primarily involve the proximal and the axial body musculature. Lesions in the dominant hemisphere uh, in the in the premotor area uh, they would lead to something which is known as apraxia. Apraxia uh, would result as a result of distortion of the planning of the movements. However, we might not actually see an overt paralysis, which is um, uh, which 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 becomes evident when there is a lesion in the precentral gyre. So that's a little bit of a difference between the precentral and the between the primary motor area and the premotor area. Lastly, we've got an area which is known as the supplementary motor area, uh, which also uh, more or less falls within the domain of the Broadman's area 6. It is located on the medial uh, surface of the cerebral hemisphere, right anterior to the paracentral lobule. So this is the paracentral lobule, and this is the anterior, uh, this, this, this region over here, anterior to the paracentral lobule, is the area where the uh, supplementary motor area is going to be present. The supplementary motor area also does contribute to the corticospinal tracts, uh, just like the premotor area. It plays an important role in the programming of the motor sequences, and so therefore the stimulation results in coordinated uh, movements of the limbs, and if there's a lesion result, uh, resulting in the supplementary motor area, then that would actually uh, lead to planning deficits and some kind of an apraxia, but an overt paralysis once again is not seen, uh, which is basically a hallmark of a lesion in the precentral gyrus. Right, to sum up, uh, to summarize, we basically have talked about the location of the primary motor areas, the premotor area, and the supplementary motor area. We've talked about the functions of these regions, how the precentral gyrus is more concerned with the execution of the movement, and hence the lesion where there results in a total paralysis. But uh, unlike the precentral gyrus, the premotor and supplementary, supplementary motor areas are higher um, uh, order areas compared to the primary motor area. So they're more concerned with the planning of the movement and lesion over there results in uh, distortion of the of the of the planning of the movement or resulting in, in, in discoordinated movement if you want to put it that way, which is uh, known as apraxia, but an overt paralysis does not occur. And we also talked about uh, the sequential inverted representation of the body uh, on the precentral gyrus, uh, which is known as the motor homunculus. And then in that context, we discussed a little bit about the blood supply of the cortex, the ACA and the MCA supplying different parts of the cortex, and how how do we actually interlink all this information to localize the lesion uh, on history and clinical examination?